together in the prayer for illumination. Oh, Jesus, you alone are worthy. You are holy. You are with us, God with us. We submit ourselves to you, God. We bow before you now. We put our hearts in a posture to receive whatever you would give us in your word and the teaching and preaching you have given Pastor Matt to share with us today. Help us to be attentive. Help us to be alert to you and your presence. Help us to look for you, to seek you with all our hearts. You have assured us that we will find you. Amen. The scripture today is Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of the Lord. Do you want to grow in wisdom? The Proverbs uh, don't really put the question to us that way. They simply describe over and over, not simply, they describe over and over and over again in very encouraging, sometimes funny, exaggerated, direct language that there is a wise way to be a follower of God in the world and there's a foolish way And the foolish way causes all sorts of harm, indirectly and directly, although after a certain point in time, if we continue to live foolishly, it's no one's fault but our own. Proverbs will not grow you up in wisdom. But if you're committed to Jesus, he's going to grow you up in wisdom, and the Proverbs will spur you on and encourage you and give you cheerful exhortations to pursue wisdom. Our preacher uh, three Sundays ago described this section of the Bible as uh, the section where we zoom out on the nation of Israel and God's pursuit of it and interactions with it and zoom in on the with God life for followers of God of the last thousands of years. The book of Job talks about suffering. Psalms guide us in prayer and Proverbs guide us in wisdom Ecclesiastes in doubt and Song of Songs in love. And I loved that summary, which is why I repeated it last week and I'm repeating it to you again. If you read through the Bible sequentially, it can be disorienting. What's going on with the nation of Israel right now? And yet, what's so lovely is that there are people that have come before us that needed this encouragement to pursue wisdom in a world that cares a lot more about foolishness and hurry. And that wisdom begins with fear. And in 2023, we're like, that doesn't sound good at all. That sounds terrible. That doesn't sound like a blessing at all. That sounds like something I don't want to experience. But the biblical idea of fear is so much larger and more profound than that. And if we want a God we can control, we're not actually interested in the things of God. And if we can't control him, then there should be a significant amount of awe and wonder that he can create from nothing, that he saves, that he judges. Even his mercy ought to put us in awe of him. Uh, We have a baptismal area over here. I was sitting down there with a friend on Monday and a very, very large bear came and kicked us out. 
He maybe wanted to be baptized. I told him ordinarily baptisms occur during Sunday morning services. And I wasn't as scared as I would have been eight years ago because I know he doesn't want to have anything to do with me. It was a hot day. He wanted to get into the water. I did yell at him and he was unimpressed because <laughs> he's not a young bear. Was I a little bit afraid? Yes. Had he stood up, would I have been more afraid? Yes. How much more wonder and awe of the one who created him and many like him of other species that are much bigger and scarier. The beginning of wisdom is being in awe, which includes fear of God. Proverbs describe to us in pithy ways what it is like to wisely love our neighbor. There are a lot of encouragements about doing honest work, and most of us are not in positions uh, to, to cheat, perhaps, as often as the, the writers of the Proverbs were getting at, but almost all of us every week have opportunities to do things right at work or not in times that no one may notice. As when the Proverbs brings that up over and over again, it's to encourage us to do our work with integrity. There's a lot more that I didn't remember, I hadn't studied the book of Proverbs in a while, about the neighbor that is actually our neighbor. And there's even some uh, encouragement too. If you have friends that live far away, that's good, but you need to cultivate friendship with the people that live near you. And I kid you not, at 8.15 this morning, one of my neighbors who has never texted me, texted me and invited me to drink coffee with him by his fire, but because I didn't recognize his number, because I haven't, we haven't hung out often, I, it took me an hour to realize what was happening. The Proverbs would encourage me to take him up on that offer and get to know him because he lives next door and I will need friendship, not just with my close friends in Tulsa where I grew up, in Colorado Springs where I lived for a year but still have some friends, St. Louis where I lived for 12 years, but also here. There are some encouragements about how to sit with those who are suffering, not say stupid things. Most of us have probably done that and it's been done towards us. And all of these are encouraging us to trust the Lord, to grow us in the skill of godly living in all the mundane ways available to us. But again, the Proverbs will not grow you in wisdom unless you seek the Lord and ask him to grow you in wisdom, and then it will encourage you in that pursuit. So I want to encourage you for a moment to ask him to grow you in wisdom. This is a lovely, lovely place to take a minute and a breath, listen to the wind or the brook, and also to ask the Lord to grow us in wisdom. Lord, indeed, we ask that you grow us in wisdom. The phrase for the first two parts of my sermon was repeated oftentimes in uh, Psalms and Wisdom Literature and Seminary by my professor Jack Collins that wisdom is skill in godly living. And I heard it so many times it just flowed out of me onto the outline. Usually I use my own words in the outline. And we need to grow in it. One of the delights of having a 17-year-old and a 2-year-old is knowing that I will need to repent less to my two-year-old because God is faithful to grow me in wisdom, faithful to help me not multiply my words when I don't need to, faithful to take a breath, listen to my wife, think for a second before jumping in. That's what wisdom offers us if we will receive it from the Holy Spirit and from our godly friends who will push back on us when they see us acting unwisely. One of the challenges of the Proverbs is that it, take, it assumes that you are listening to it um, in order to be encouraged and that you're willing to accept some challenging metaphors and images. Proverbs 11 verse 22 says this, like a gold ring in a pig's snout 
is a beautiful woman without discretion. Now, if we're reading that casually, we could be offended. Wisdom is also personified as a woman. But the Proverbs is written from a male point of view. In the same way that you might say to your friends, yes, he's good looking, but he's a jerk. It's not worth it. Yes, that is a nice suit that he's wearing. But he's mean to you. The Proverbs not only want us to be catching all these pithy phrases in a row, they want us to be willing to talk with our friends about where we see wisdom and foolishness. One of the early parts of the Proverbs, especially chapters um, 5 through 8, is about avoiding lust and adultery. It applies to both the single and the married person. We avoid these things because they are wildly dangerous. In Proverbs chapter 7, again with uh, both a literal and a personified picture, it says this, With much seductive speech she persuades him, with her smooth talk she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim she has laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. This language is similar to James when he talks about how the wealthy should weep and howl for the danger of wealth. It's similar to Jesus saying, avoid lust at all costs, and if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. The writer of the Proverbs is letting us know that avoiding this is life-giving, and giving into it will cost us our life. Back in chapter 5, it gives a PG-13 or an R-rated description of instead of Lust, enjoying the spouse that we're given. For the single person, that's either an opportunity for them to avoid lust and serve the Lord in the world. Paul talks about this a little more directly in Jesus. But for the married person, it's not simply avoiding sin, it's choosing life. That's in chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. I encourage you to read it. Skill in godly living 100% assumes that we can accept and integrate correction. Do you have friends that will push back on you? I was talking with a friend about a, a mistake I made about 15 years ago in retirement planning. And it still stung a little bit because I screwed up. I don't feel a great deal of shame because I am not going to make that mistake again. But why did it sting? Because I screwed up. And it'll make retirement a little more challenging. How did he know that? Because he's my friend and we talk about these things. And as much as it stings, that's how actual friendship works. We're willing to talk with one another, dialogue about these things. We will get them wrong, but we'll often get them right. And friends, Pun intended. That is one of the great gifts of the kingdom. Our spiritual friends that love you no matter what and are actually willing to be honest with you. Do you have friends here? Can't be friends with everyone. The average church person can know about 60-ish names. Way more people than that here. And it takes a while. And there will be some missteps. And it requires wisdom to receive the wise gift of friendship, but it is worth it. If all of your friends live in another town, like far away, I'm glad that you're blessed with those friends. You need friends where you live also in this spiritual community. You cannot read the book of Proverbs, but accept that that is one of the ways that we receive wisdom from the Holy Spirit. I was in seventh grade, I got in trouble a lot. And at different points in time, my school had a director of discipline. Sounds like a terrible job. My seventh grade year, it was a very kind and good man named Mr. Timms. And I was sitting into his office, and he opened up to Proverbs 12, and he said, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. (laughs) 
And because of his kindness, and the fact that I could tell by the way the meeting was going that he wasn't going to punish me additionally, I was able to actually receive that and remember it. Gosh, that and I didn't learn as much from it as I might have. It is actually good for us to sometimes receive a challenging word from scripture or from a friend or from someone in authority over us so that we might learn because it honors God. In many ways, the Proverbs are like signs along the highway. When we're almost out of gas, what would, what would we need? We're looking for the sign. Or the gas, that's the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of us being able to stay on the drive. When we've been driving for a while, we need food. In the Proverbs, that is wise friendship. That is where we receive sustenance for the journey. And then there are a lot of cautions to avoid foolishness with our money, with our words, with our time, like the dog returning to its vomit is the one who continues to repeat his mistakes. And it is important that we understand that the Proverbs do not work um, as they are not promises to us. There are a lot of encouragements to not be lazy, but that doesn't mean if we work hard, we will for sure have enough money. It is not that simple. It is not that basic, perhaps especially in Connecticut. The point of those Proverbs is it is better to work hard than to be lazy. I think one of the more interesting Proverbs, and if you're daring, you will pray this, about money is from chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Two things, seven, eight, and nine. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. That's a quest for wisdom. Give me neither poverty nor riches. And listen to why. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who's the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane, profane the name of my God. Throughout the Proverbs, there are all these encouragements to attend to the poor within our limits, to also attend to our future planning, to stop making some of the mistakes I made in 2009 with respect to those things, so that we can honor God and bless those in our life. Jesus talked about Proverbs 38 and 9 in much more stark terms in Matthew 13 and warned us that our desire to honor God could be distracted by all the trappings that the world is selling us. And the encouragement of the Proverbs is that most of what we do to honor God, most of what we do as a follower of God is found in the regular rhythms of daily life. Small decisions to stop and talk with our neighbor, Proverbs 27.10. The small decision to not, like vinegar on an open wound, sing songs to the heavy-hearted. Small things like doing the right thing by our boss at work, even if she or he won't find out. Skill and godly living honors God and it's in mostly little ways that we would deem insignificant but caught up in to the glorious plan of God. Those ways heal the world and honor him and care for our neighbors. Sometimes I hear people say that um, wisdom comes with age. And what I'm about to say is not in the Proverbs, but I have been working in churches for a long time and with people. Nope. (laughs) 
But I say that because one of the sweet promises of the gospel is that for a follower of God, your suffering will mature you. And that's part of the invitation of Jesus is first to trust him and then in thankfulness learn to live in light of his kingdom and then in obedience. And through that, which sounds like I'm deviating from the Proverbs, through that we grow in wisdom which honors God and serves our neighbors well. Without Jesus, we would never pray Proverbs 30, 8 or 9, give me neither poverty nor riches. We would just pray about the poverty one. But with Jesus, we know that the things the world is trying to sell us that seem shiny, like he talked about in Matthew 13, will not give rest to our soul. Not the best vacation taken at the perfect time with the perfect people every year, with no mistake, will give rest to our soul. Not the perfect retirement planning, though it is important that you plan for retirement wisely. It's all over the Proverbs. But then when we go to him for rest for our soul, we return to the Proverbs and we are cheered up and cheered on by the Holy Spirit who grows us in wisdom for the purposes of glorifying God and serving our neighbor and even that we, us, might mature in faith and life. Would you pray with me? God, please grow us in wisdom. We would prefer through gentle encouragements from friends, but if we need it to come a little more directly, give us strength to accept it. We would prefer for it to come through knowledge and not through suffering, and yet we are so thankful for your promises that for followers of God, suffering does indeed produce maturity. Lord, we long to be wise before you, before the neighbors you've put into our lives, before our coworkers, our children, our friends. Give us strength to receive the many ways wisdom comes to us from you, that we might grow up in faith and in life. Amen.